without a doubt, this is one of the biggest challenges, goals, objectives I've ever set myself. And I guess it sort of started the last time I was here when I, you know, I'd gone from fifth and I slipped back to 11th and you realize, wow, you know, I was 39 then, I'm now 41. You've got limited opportunities at, at this. And so, of course, that doubled my resolve, doubled down on myself, you know, realize you don't know how many chances you'll get to be able to compete with the best. And um, at the moment, I still feel like I'm getting better, you know, physically and uh, yeah, tactically. I still honestly feel like I've got improvements to still make. But um, it's amazing in the final week of your prep where you start thinking about the next one. <laughs> you think about what you'll do next time a little bit better. But um, yeah, I had a sort of made a plan, which I haven't been very good at in past years of how I wanted the year to pan out. And especially considering my year is quite chaotic. So bringing some order to that. And uh, it's planned out sort of exactly as I wanted it to. I've hit all my marks and um, yeah, I'm really excited to see where I'm at on the weekend. So we're about 6k from the finish. Yeah. Is this a bit of a visualization? Uh, this is like the last, again? the last drag before the last drag. Yep. That's what I call it psychologically. You get over this one, and then there's only one more. So you're going at the right pace right now. About 3:45. Well, <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> Last year, the Nice, like the world championships as we had in the, in the gap year, I had a terrible race. And I can handle having a terrible race. I mean, it's a, I've never been a prolific winner. I'm not a great champion. I don't win all the time. I have a lot more races where I get beaten. Um, but the hardest part is the people that support you and back you and, you know, keep showing up every day to, to give you all this, you know, guidance and, and support that they can. And to have to talk, talk to them about you having a bad performance, that really stung and makes you start thinking about, you know, I hate, I hate putting people through that. And so I started to think that, but those people, true to script, you know, really said, no, listen, that's do it better, that's double down. And I would often not ask things of people around me because I was, you know, I guess afraid of failing and feeling like I'd asked too much of them and then not being able to deliver and you know made it really clear I had a very candid conversation with a bunch you know of very close people to me and they said well if you don't ask for all the help in the world we can't give you the best possible support to give you the best chance to do well so that was really the outcome to to really lean on those people that that back me even more uh, Brett Kirby at Nike I think was really a fundamental one in that he was really bullish about, listen, man, you, you still got this. You know, you still, there's still a lot of improvement in there, uh, particularly, obviously, in the, the running part, but just me as an athlete. And, um, you know, and then that obviously fed with, you know, the team and still continuing to believe in me and having me part of a, you know, one of the you know, top cycling teams in the world, even at my age, um, showed that they had belief in my abilities. And um, from there on, it was about, formulating a plan to um, make the most of the environment that I had around me and uh, and I feel like that's what I was able to do this year. I had a, a, a consolidated focus on, um, on, on this run race and I don't often get a chance to do that and I guess when we look back historically the only times I've done that I would tend to have done quite well. Uh, in fact often I've won <laughs> the race so uh, it had been a few years since I'd given myself the opportunity to actually really build up to something. Um, the agreement with the team was that from the beginning of September I'd be free from team duties and so I was able to focus 100% on this. So I guess if I just step back a little bit, the first part of the year was building different stages around you know, technical improvements in swimming and running and obviously the bike racing kind of takes care of a lot of that itself but using the bike racing to get as fit as possible so instead of turning up to bike races too tired and, and sort of struggling to contribute to the team because I've been training for an Ironman, sort of turning up a little bit better so I can contribute more to the team but get more fitness benefit from it to then take back into my Ironman training. And so in the last eight weeks, I've never arrived, you know, at this point in the year more motivated to train because I really haven't had a training block all year because it's just been race, race, bounce around, bit of a training block here, bit of a training block there, race, race, race sort of no real 
structure. And it was by design. I mean, that was completely by design. And the last eight weeks, we've had a chance to sort of put it all together in a more structured, focused Ironman, traditional build up, balance build. Um, and yeah, I've been able to do more volume, but at more intensity, more quality training in the, hour, in the, in the big hours than what I'd ever done in the past. Um, you know, we looked at historically, generally my best training was in sort of January, February in LA when I'm out there with Geraint Thomas doing our pre-season. I guess you've come off a break, you're fresh. I really felt like that and sort of for the first time ever I was, you know, in October feeling like that and doing, you know, I guess better in my, in my training as you'd want to <laughs> than what I was doing back in January, February, you know, in past years, which was, you know, incidentally, historically my better training periods. So, uh, you know, small things, I guess, particularly if we want to talk about running, Brett kind of tricked me into doing, you know, two longer runs a week. You know, the, the general track session, instead of your traditional mile or 1200 meter 1K efforts, all of a sudden they were 10 minutes or 20 minutes or 15 minutes and, you know, different variations, an hour, hour 10, hour 15 of work. But he'd, you know, say good warm up, 45 minutes, you know, 10 plus K and warm down. So. By the time you do that, you get back, you look at your watch, it's two hours or a bit over, you've done 32, 33K and that's a long run <laughs> for me. Um, but then a couple of days later, you back that up with your long run, you know, general traditional long run for the week. So being able to string that together for six weeks has just, you know, changes your perspective of what a, the other day we did, you know, 21K here is sort of the final kind of, you know, hour ramp and then 30 minutes just cruising back to town and, as you kind of know, I got there, I felt like I, I should do more. You know, I mean, obviously following the program, following what we'd done. Normally, off a shorter preparation, which often I get for these races, that week before, two weeks out, I'm still doing proper sessions, you know, trying to teach the body what's to come the week after. But because this time around, I've been able to do that for the last, you know, six, seven weeks. I mean, at the end of that period, so a week ago, I was really hanging on in those final sessions in LA. I really was excited to start, you know, freshening up um, and get to a race, which is generally a good sign that I've, you know, I've pushed my body to the, to the absolute limit of what I can handle in training. And that was, that was the idea, you know, historically, Brett had seen a pattern of six to eight weeks. It was sort of the period where I could really keep building. And after that, you're just sort of digging a hole for yourself and uh, yeah, feels like we nailed it and we'll find out you know, where that puts me in this world-class field on Saturday. Training structure for any Ironman, I guess, sort of depends on where you feel like you need to work. I mean, you obviously always need to work on your strengths, so the cycling is, is that. And, and the running has sort of become a strength. At times, the swimming is my strength, so I guess the balance between the swim and the run can change a little or the focus just as to when I do different sessions, key sessions it, it, at a point in the week. Um, for example, this time around to make a bit of a push with the run, we actually put the key run session before the key bike session because the cycling, I'd just come off a big block of racing throughout the summer with the team. So I felt like I had really good cycling condition. Not that I don't always need to improve on it, but I probably didn't need to be fresh to do those sessions. I could you know, handle being a bit off and get through those, but have that freshness to get more out of my running. Um, but above all, swimming was definitely the biggest focus the last six to eight weeks consistently. So ensuring that I was fresh for the key swim sessions was always the number one objective. Uh, but yeah, there was certainly a bit of a compromise at times between the run and the bike, depending on judging where we we're at with the condition level and, and you know obviously the ultimate where we we're trying to get to um, using that as a barometer. Uh, of a pathway so yeah there's definitely a little bit of a balancing act and it, it's almost on a weekly you know if not sometimes daily sort of schedule depending on how I'm feeling um, to ensure that you get the most out of the quality sessions that you have during the week and um, and obviously yeah prioritizing where you want to improve the most at that point I personally don't have really any knowledge scientifically too much. I have a lot of experience. I trust, you know, Tim Kerris and Brett Kirby, you know, Adrian Lopez from the team who, who uh, sort of coordinates everything from the team side and, and helps a lot with the cycling part. 
they're, they're very clever. They all do all the research and all the studies and, uh, and know all that. I, I don't, you know, I, I, I'm a big fan of delegated legislation. So um, let the experts do their jobs and I just do what I'm told. I mean, they'll certainly ask a lot of feedback of how I feel, where I'm at. Um, you know, obviously heat's a big thing here. So that was a big sort of discussion point, how we handle the preparation for that. And uh, yeah, I just trust those. I just try and find the best people and work with them. Diet's an interesting one because in Ironman, triathlon particularly, the training demands I think are quite high on the body. And yeah, you're treading a very fine line between what your body can handle and breaking often. So I don't think too much about a diet. I, I more eat, eat to train and, um, and recover so I can train properly and keep an eye on my body, how I look. And also obviously running speed's a great one or climbing speed. You know, if you start getting a bit slow, it's probably worth jumping on the scales and seeing if you, yeah, maybe been eating too many, having too many caramel lattes or, you know, the extra muffin or carrot cake that you probably shouldn't have been having that you thought was okay. But, or if there's another problem, fatigue, you know, as we all know, can, a lot of water retention can happen, you know, different things can sort of indicate um, yeah, that you might be overtraining or just tired or run down or whatever. So, but yeah, that's really my barometer. Um, in this prep, I've jumped on the scales a few times and, and I guess sort of been surprised at sort of how low my body weight was. Uh, and so I've decided to really not focus on it because, you know, I have been training. I know at times right on my limit, you know, of what I can handle and, um, and I just wanted to ensure that I stay healthy. Yeah, ketones are a huge part of the sport now. I mean, it's kind of like altitude training and you know, different things It's become, you know, every team is, I guess, adopting them and using them in different ways and obviously endurance athletes as well. You know, I've known the HMN guys actually since 2019 um, through, through Nike, um, you know, you testing their different products and and the science of them continues to evolve. But um, personally for me, I, I just find from a training perspective, I just have a bit more at the end of the day when I think I'm gonna be out, you know, or in a hard session, I just feel like I can just dig a little bit deeper and it's still there. You don't sort of, that blow up point comes a little bit later. You know, from a swimming perspective, cognitively, I feel like I concentrate really well. You know, if it's when I'm going to a hard swim and I'm feeling a little oh, a bit tired, you know, I've had a big day the day before or it's early in the morning or I've had a big session in the morning, I'm swimming in the afternoon. I, I It's a crutch, I go to it, you know, wanting something and, and it feels like it just switches me on to, to concentrate on what I'm doing. And then of course, you know, there's, now there's probably a lot more data about the recovery benefits because at the end of the day, you know, training is, you do the work, but it's how well you recover that gets the most out of that work. I mean, yes, of course you get benefit while doing it, but if you don't recover and absorb that load, that's, that's where the gains are made. So, um, and that's where I believe ketones have a lot more research. So, you know, in, in a training perspective, it's, you know, before, always before training, often during the day as well, especially when there's key sessions in the afternoon. Um, and then also post training uh, for recovery one of the first, well, the first thing I usually have when I get home. And then on race day, it's uh, pre-race, you know, before the swim, obviously, again, I'm wanting to really laser in on that. And then I, I try to have one at the start of the run. I always have one in my bag there. Sometimes it's a bit frantic and I, I don't grab it, but the last two PB marathons I've run, uh, the 244s, I've both had a ketone shot at the start of the run. And uh, I think it's, even if it's just, uh, placebo that makes me feel like I've got more energy at the end of the run. I've finished off both runs feeling really, really strong and had the same, you know, sort of sensation that I would normally get in training. Yeah, I mean, that was the other great thing about this last training block. I was averaging, I mean, 100 kilometers running. I would sort of be scrimping those last few Ks or sort of bog jogging, you know, just getting them in to make it up to 100. This time around, Throughout the whole, you know, eight weeks, I was I was averaging closer to 110 comfortably. So some weeks over, you know, some weeks just under, but even just in four or five runs, you know, really doing that comfortably. 
and this week felt like, or last week I guess is when it started and I ran 70 kilometers and it really felt like I'd done nothing. I really was worried, am I doing enough? But it was a 70% drop. But like I said to you, when you do a bit less there, you kind of, not that I did more cycling than normal, but I probably kept my normal cycling load and swimming I actually increased it a little bit because it's an opportunity. The swimming, you can get a bit more bang for the buck, you know, right there at the end um, to just, you know, really just get a little bit of extra conditioning for race day uh, because it's obviously an hour effort as opposed to the other two, which is, you know, closer to four and, and closer to, you know, ideally two, 240. So, yeah, around 70%. And then this week, it's obviously much less again. You know, it's even half that again. So I guess, well, I guess then we're down to sort of 50% leading in. I ran 14 kilometers today. Tomorrow I might do 10 max, um, maybe a little longer, maybe 12. Um, but, and then maybe another, you know, few K on Friday just to make sure my shoes fit and go through the gears and more just to probably just, as an opportunity to not think about all the millions of things that I've got to think about, you know, getting ready for the race. So. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a, you know, basically in two weeks, I'll run the same volume that I've been running every week consistently for the last couple of months. For me to win Kona, I need to swim really well. I need to be at the front of the race, you know, uh, yeah, I need to be close to the front of the race in the swim. I need to get on the bike with great legs and I need to be able to get to the front of the race, you know, quickly um, with, you know, with the field, with whoever's gonna be at the front. I need to be there with them. I can't be chasing a big bunch of really strong guys. Uh, and then from there, we need to make sure that it's a hard bike. Uh, I don't care if there's people there, but as long as the pressure's on, we've seen uh, this the unique thing about Kona, it can be quite windy, particularly in the back half of the bike and the heat, that's when it really starts to kick up. And if you can really push the pace and just make everyone go that little bit harder than they would like, you know, that's then gonna, my run won't really drop off regardless of how exhausted I am off after the bike I've noticed or if I'm fresh I don't run any better so whereas I notice a lot of other athletes there's a very big discrepancy between how fast they run when they are in a controlled race environment first let's say you know very still they ride in packs you know they can do their own thing um, as opposed to when there's some pressure and there's people everywhere and you know the, the race has exploded if you like it tends to explode even more on the run so I got to swim well I got to get there on the bike. I got to go put the pressure on the bike and then just be stronger than everyone else on the run.